sure where folks come from other bodies and what is typical or not, but I like gathering around the table. I don't, <laughs> the whole grab a wafer and a shot as you walk out the door on Sunday is not my idea of the Lord's Supper, so I'm thankful we take time to reflect and thank you, Dad, for that. Psalm 73. This morning we'll read verses 21 through 28 together. Psalm 73, 21. When my heart was embittered, and I was pierced within, and I was senseless and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you, You've taken hold of my right hand, and with your counsel you will guide me, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? Beside you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. I'm going to attempt to do justice to this last part of this psalm, but, you know, it's, it's really hard to do. And uh, I, I trust that as you read through Psalm 73 this last week that you were grappling with it as much as I was. Uh, these are some pretty bold thoughts, some pretty radical statements made by Asaph. But to go back a little bit so we set the context walking into these because he takes us on this amazing journey in a short period of time. And I'm so thankful for the walk because it's like each step of the way as I've walked through this psalm again, it's just like he, everything he tells me, my arms just keep opening up wider and wider to God. It's just amazing how he does this. And then he brings us to this amazing conclusion. But he starts off again for us with this enviousness of the wicked in verse 2 and his foot almost slipping. And we come back to this idea again at the end as he will talk about his relationship to God. But he wanted their treasures, their prosperity. He wanted what they referred to as the good life, what we would refer to as the good life, right? But then he realizes that that life is not good at all. And what seems to be a treasure he's going to find is not the ultimate treasure. But he is going to, as he walks through the psalm, he compares their prosperity with all of the troubles that he faces in life as he seeks to follow the Lord. And he starts to challenge himself and, and wrestle with the fact, was he really wasting his time in pursuing God and growing in that relationship with him? And he comes to the conclusion, but it's when he walks into the sanctuary, right? When he is in the midst of God's people and they are singing these psalms, that this is when all of a sudden his perspective is changed and his vision is set aright. And he begins to realize, right, that their end is going to be a swift judgment by God. This helps him to understand that, that what he supposed to be a treasure was no treasure at all. And if he even tempted to hold it in his hands, it would crumble, right? But he realized what ultimately was the true and only treasure and the only one that could satisfy for time and eternity, and that's God. That's God. And I wrestle with this all week, right? Is he my treasure? Is there ever a sense in my heart, if I'm being honest before God, I love you, God, but there's maybe something other that I cherish alongside of you. He is going to come to the conclusion that God and God alone is sufficient for him. He alone is the only one who can truly satisfy the thirsting soul. It is only he alone and nothing else or no one else. So his lesson to us then, he's, he brings us to these last verses, 21 through 28, 
is that we should treasure God above all else. It's a powerful thought. Above every relationship. As much as I love my wife and, and I love my kids and they are absolutely an unbelievable gift to me. Yet. Right? Yet. So this is the call for us and the challenge as we walk through these last verses. Treasuring God above all else. And the reality that he comes to is simply this, that God is infinitely precious and satisfying. It's intrinsic to who he is. We think about that, right? It's intrinsic to who God is. He is infinitely, infinitely precious and satisfying. He can't be anything other than that. If he is perfect, and he is, if he is perfect, then there can be no sense of which God is deficient in anything. And there's, there's nothing more beautiful. There's nothing more amazing. There's, there's nothing more awe-inspiring. There's nothing more to cherish greater than God. Nothing and no one. He can't delight in anyone other than himself. It's not a if you will, a, a sort of egotistical thing on behalf of God. He just simply is perfection. He is the ultimate. He is the utmost. He is, as we've seen in the Psalms, He is the highest itself. There's none higher. There's none greater. So He takes us on this journey. He begins with His eyes on God in verse 1. Surely God is good to Israel. He then transitions in verses 2 to 12, and he starts looking at his neighbors and envying their life. Then he turns to himself, verses 13 and following, and even tries to wrestle with this, verse 16. He tries to ponder these things on his own, but he still it's troublesome to him. He just can't get his grip on this. And what we find him doing is we find him pushing God into the margins. As he wrestles with this, he starts pushing God off to the side, and all of a sudden, God becomes the peripheral, and everything else becomes what is what he focuses on. But God isn't supposed to be in the margins. He's not supposed to be in the peripherals. We weren't made to be in the center, but oftentimes that's where we put ourselves. This is our rebellion against God and his sovereignty over our life. This is why Jesus says, if you want to come after me, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself and take up your cross daily. There, there's something that needs to happen in regards to yourself. You need to die to yourself. But we have this tendency of putting God off into the margins and into the peripheral. I mean, think about our day when we get up in the morning and we have intent to spend time with him. I, I really intend as I go to bed at night, I'm going to spend time in the word of God and be with him and, and to commune with him. But then I get up and then something happens. And then another something happens. And then another something happens. And God just keeps getting pushed farther and farther and farther out. Before you know it, the day is done and I've spent no time with him. Tomorrow, right? I'll get to it tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes. And the same thing happens. He just keeps getting pushed off into the margins. What Asaph comes to the conclusion is that God is supposed to be central. That's what we're supposed to do with God. He is to be central in everything that we do, in our relationships, in the things that we do in life, whether we're at work or out in the marketplace, wherever it is, He is to be central in everything. So he brings his eyes back on God, and this is where the lights come on for him. The new perspectives come, and all of a sudden he starts to realize there's a lofty view of life, and it's focused on God. Asaph realized that he was looking in the wrong direction. He, he was looking around himself, and he was looking within himself, right? And I don't know about you, but sometimes I seek within myself to find the answers. And this is what the world tells you to do, right? Look within, right? Find your light and your hope that's within you. But the only answers come from up. <laughs> they only come from up. That's why God drives us to our knees, so that we look up, right? Because we often find ourselves looking everywhere else but that. His perspective was wrong. He, instead of looking at it and stepping back and looking at the situation, he was looking at it up close. When he got into the context of the sanctuary and in the context of worship, all of a sudden his perspective changed. He was looking at the natural man, not the spiritual man. He was looking at the temporal things, not the eternal things. Everything was off for him until he came to worship. 
And I'll just tell you that the thing that I'm constantly reminded of as I walk through the Psalms is the simple fact of the problem is not God's problem, it's my problem. <laughs> when I have troubles with God and I wrestle with God and who he is and, and what's happening in the world, it isn't the problem, it isn't with God, it's with me. It's often my vision is off. God's perfect, so he can't have the problem, right? That's what we're brought face to face with. But the, the amazing thing is his grace and mercy when he walks with us and walks us through this. But the lights turn on for Asaph in verse 17, and that's where things just start unfolding for him. He turned his vision back on God, and all of a sudden, verse 17, second line, he saw their end, the end of the wicked. Literally in Hebrew, he saw their afterward, the akrith, their afterward. In other words, they live life like this is it, right? This is, we're in the now, right? YOLO, you only live life once. It's all about right here, right now. But there's an afterward that they don't realize. And Asaf saw that, right? This is where he gains the eternal perspective. And he realizes that their future, the true future that is to come, he realizes that everything that they have pursued, everything that they have sought after, everything that they put their time and effort into was going to come undone. You think about that in a moment, right? The moment that you die, in that very moment, everything is gone. Everything. You spend your whole life laboring and striving for and working after and all the sacrifices to get and to have and to achieve and to accomplish and all the accolades. The moment you die, it's gone. <laughs> it's over with. And he realized how fleeting this was and how short-lived this was and their doom was eternal. So then comes God's personal rejection of them in verses 18 and following. Surely you have set them, capital U, this is God doing this. You have set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form, their image. They just, they're hollow. They're empty just as much as the things that they pursued. They're as vacant as the life that they strove so hard for, the good life. So I came across this quote by C.S. Lewis. He says, we can be left utterly and absolutely outside, repelled, exiled, estranged, and finally unspeakably ignored. That's hell. That's hell, the lack of the presence of God. But that's what makes heaven heaven, and he understands this, right? That, that the blessings that come to the godly, to those who have a relationship with God, they are eternal, but the sufferings and everything that we go through are so short-lived in comparison to. So this is the realization that he has, and, and the, the realization for him, the fact that God is not merely just an object of speculation, but he's an object of worship. made me think of the words of Roy Clement, pastor of Eden Baptist Church in Cambridge, England. He said, worship puts God at the center of our vision. It is vitally important because it is only when God is at the center of our vision that we see things as they really are. That was the moment. The aha moment in Asaph's life, right? So the exhortation to us is that whenever we feel like life is unfair and we're not partaking of the good life, go worship. <laughs> Spend time adoring and glorifying God, right? Get your spiritual vision where it needs to be, and then you can see the world for what it is. Amazing psalm, isn't it? And it just, there's, there's so much here, but we have to come to truth triumphant. Some lessons he tells us. Sum it all up for you right here. God is good, and he is the ultimate good. And there's some things that Asaph is going to unfold for us, is he's going to give us reasons why we should treasure God above all else. And there's only really two thoughts, and it is this. The first one is God is good. Now, notice with me in verses 21 through 22, and we're going to pick some of these things apart here and look at them, because there are some observations that I had walking through this that I think are very instructful for us in our moments of failure, because we are bound to fail. At least I am, right? 
Because if I wasn't, I'd already be in heaven. So here we are. So verses 21 and 22, he says this, When my heart was embittered, and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. There's a lot here in these verses, but the first thing that I noticed walking through them as I went back was the statement of I and you that goes through here. It starts really in verse 22. Then I was senseless before you. He is going to dialogue with God. He's going to interact with God directly, right? At this moment, he had been so far from him, looking at the world, looking at himself. God was off in the peripheral, in the margin, over here somewhere. He took his eyes off God. Now they're back on God. Now he's talking with God, right? And not only that, but he's on a heart level with God. Because in verse 21, notice, he talks about the fact that his heart was embittered. And in verse 26, he is going to reflect on the fact that God is the strength of his heart. This is not a superficial wrestling here, and this is not a superficial conversation that he's having with God. He realizes that what really needs to happen is that as he is addressing this issue in his life, it must change his heart. It's where the change must come. I find that it's oftentimes easier for us in our progression as believers, in our progressive sanctification, it's easy for us to change our vocabulary. It's really hard for us to change our character and how we live. See, we hear something, sounds good. We take those words and we start using them, right? But do we really understand here in our heart that the seat and center of all of life, right? Do I understand that truth there? Is the change taking place there? He realizes that he needs to have the discussion with God. And it isn't that he is informing God of anything that God doesn't already know. It's about him exposing his heart before God and the willingness for God to change that, right? I, I want you to transform me from within. So I, I, I wrestle with these things because sometimes, I, I don't know about you, but it's like I just... It's not always that I'm intending to, but it just seems like sometimes I'm just putting on the front of I'm a Christian. Like we're around each other, right? It's like I, 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 every Sunday, you can get into this mode of I'm supposed to behave a certain way and look a certain way and be a certain way and, and these things, and we just do that, right? But inside, right? Inside, I know really my heart's not where it ought to be. And I really need to wrestle with this with God, but I'm just avoiding it, right? Because I know that when I do this, then I'm going to have to a, a confess that there is something wrong in me, and I don't want to make it known to God. But I know he already knows. And what Asaph is going to find out is that as much as he thinks God is far away from him, God isn't far away from him at all. He may have, in his vision, pushed God off in the peripheral and the margin, but God was right there by his side. That, to me, is mind-blowing. So first observation I had as we walked through these verses, 21 and 22, is this, that God uses our failures to give us a deeper understanding of our total need for him. This is where Asaph was brought. Vision brought back on God. He sees God for who he is. All of a sudden, the realization that is coming to him, and again, he only has a short amount of space. I mean, you know, you can't sing these songs forever, right? So he only has so much space to unfold this journey. But he realizes that in our failures, God helps us to understand just how much we need him. Inherently, we think too highly of ourselves. We really do. I mean, this is why we're sinners. There's an element of selfishness to sin, yes. right? It's not the base of sin itself, but there is an element to that, right? I mean, that is our rebellion against the sovereignty of God and his laws and him saying, this is what I want you to do. Thou shalt, thou shalt, we say, no, I will not. So in ourselves, we really do have inherently this higher view of ourselves than we ought to have. So what does God do? He allows us to fall. Could he not have stopped Asaph from taking this journey? Absolutely. But see, there were things that Asaph needed to realize. He's a part of the worship team. He needs to understand who he's worshiping a lot better. 
So God allows us to fail so that he can teach us just how much we absolutely need him. Amen. Right? Because it's on our knees that we look up. And any time that you and I start thinking, man, I'll, I'll never do this sin again. I'm not going to be like that dog that returns to it, vomit and lick it up, Proverbs says. I'm never going to do that, right? Look out. Right? Look out. Because that's us standing on our own two feet saying, I'm never going to do this. But if left to myself, guess what? I'm going to do that again. 1 Corinthians, right? 12, 10, 12. Let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. This is a man problem, right? We're, we're John Wayne, we're Clint Eastwood. I uh, can do this on my own, right? I don't need to walk in dependence. Right? It's just what you strive for as men is that I'm going to go off and have my own household, right? And I'm going to be the king of my castle, right? And I'm not going to be dependent on my father and my mother any longer. I'm going to do my thing, right? But then I realize that my whole life is dependence. I'm a creature. <laughs> it's the reality of my existence. So sometimes I forget this, so God, he brings us down, right? So the Christian life, we can say for a lot, a lot of it, is just us being knocked off our feet. But the amazing thing about the Christian life, as we walk with God, yes, we get knocked off our feet, but we get up one more time than we got knocked down. And ultimately, we will be in his presence, refined. And we will look at us and see his image, the image of his son, and we will be finished. For all of eternity, we will relish in his glory. Amen? So take the knockdown right because that's where we learn second observation i had is this that god uses our failures to give us a deeper understanding of how faithful his love is towards us verse 23 nevertheless i am continually with you you have taken hold of my right hand this is his faithfulness to asaph asaph realized right as he got through all of this, it wasn't the reflection of the fact that, man, I had a really good grip on God. No, God had a really good grip on me. Isn't that awesome? Right? I was pushing God in the peripherals. I was shoving him over in the margin. But here's the amazing thing. God never pushed him away. Right? Reflecting on the thought. He was alone so that we would never have to be alone. This is true of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. He came to realize, right, as his perspective was brought back where it needed to be, that God is truly good to his people. But he realized that the whole time that he was going through this ordeal, that God had his hand the whole time. And it wasn't just any hand. Notice what he says, your right hand, right? His right hand. Why does he say right hand? Ponder that one. So he came to see, verse 22, that he was senseless, he was ignorant, he was like a beast before God. And as he's kicking himself, right, and we put in modern terminology, Asaph saying, man, I was an idiot. I thought I could reason this out on my own, and I can't. And in reality, this is who I am. And as he's sitting here kicking himself, all of a sudden he utters one of the most wonderful words we will ever hear, nevertheless. Wa'ani. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. little hint right hand you think about it so when jesus was ascended into heaven he took his seat where at the right hand of the father why because the right is the place of great power and authority absolute right so he took hold of his right hand not his left in other words it's not my ability and god's help it's just he's solely my strength. So he realized that all this time as he walked through this, God had not abandoned him in spite of his senselessness, his ignorant behavior, even though he was beast-like, right? 
Even though he almost slipped, the reason why he didn't go down that slippery slope all the way is because God had a hold of his hand firmly and would not let go. When you think about the faithful love of God, mm -hmm. how many times that we are, are ignorant, how many times that, that we, right, we call into question his character, we challenge him, we doubt him and even with all of that in our sin he does not leave us alone not if we're his own the third observation i had is this from verse 24 god uses our failures to give us a deeper understanding of our need for his counsel and guidance safely to glory verse 24 with your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. Now, I love this because we know we cannot make sense of this world without God's guidance. This is the realization he had. I tried to ponder this verse 16. It was troublesome in my sight. We need God's help to pilot us through all of this stuff. And so he recognizes the fact that God is going to do this. Notice what he says. With your counsel, you will guide me. You will guide me. Is a hifil and perfect, it means continuousness, but it's a, it's a movement towards a point of completion. That you will lead me along. You will take me through this life. You will pilot me through all of these things. Although I'll wrestle and struggle and doubt and go through all of this stuff, you will always be my side. And in the end, you will bring me to where I need to be. That's the assurance I have. Not in my own abilities, but in God. He realized that not only did God have his hand in the struggle, but God was going to guide him and lead him safely into glory. It's an amazing thought, verse 4. And afterward, this is literal word order, and afterward to glory receive me. What's he talking about here? He's talking about eternal glory. He's talking about heaven. You know this word, lakak in Hebrew that's used here? It's used in reference to God taking up Enoch and Elijah to heaven. <laughs> right? Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more. Why? Because God took him. <laughs> I need you up here, buddy. Mm -hmm. This is what's going to happen. He's going to guide us through his life, and then when it's time, he's going to take us home. And Asaph realizes no matter what I do and the failures that I have and all of these things, God is going to walk beside me, and in the end, he's going to bring me to where I need to be. So this glory here is the eternal glory of being with God. We get to be with him. So then that leads him to this final thought. God is the ultimate good, verses 25 through 28. And the realization that he puts in here, verse 27, as he talks about the judgment and those who are perish and so on, is that distance and separation and, and the misery that's going to be because you're not going to have God if you are not walking with him now and if you don't have the relationship now. But he is going to dwell on the fact that he is the ultimate good for his life. Verse 25, Who am I in heaven but you, and beside you I desire nothing, nothing on earth. So here's verse 25 in, in the Hebrew order. He begins off with this, Whom but, ha but, but you have I in heaven. Then in the middle part of the verse he says, And beside you none there is I desire on earth. So he brackets everything, between everything. It doesn't matter what you offer, heaven, earth, anything in between doesn't matter. All of that I reject. All that I reject. I thought about this, you know. Because I thought, what if what if someone came and offered, right? What if like Satan did to Christ, right? All the kingdoms are mine, I'll give them to you, right? You just What if I was offered everything I could ever imagine life to be? Like all the places I, would, I, I could go and, and all the foods that I could eat and all the relationships that I'd want to have and all the things that I could ever, like the, the good life. If I were to define what the good life would be for Steve McDougall, what is it that I would like? If someone offered all of that to me, you can have every day like you want, no pain, no suffering, everything amazing, everything you want. Would I, would I be willing to give all of that up for the sake of just having God? That's what he's coming down to, right? I mean, this is why you can't put this in words, and I, I really, there's not enough time. I mean, when you think about it, the reality is, is it's going to take all of eternity for us to worship the great I am, Yahweh. To tell him how amazing he is, it's going to take us all of eternity to do that. 
because he's infinitely precious mm -hmm. and infinitely satisfying. There will never be an end to our rejoicing in him. But would I trade him for the good life? <laughs> so I came across as Charles Wesley. Yeah, I'd love dear saints, man. There's so much we learn from him. He was thinking about this verse, verse 26, on his deathbed. <laughs> what a way to go to heaven. <laughs> right? So he was so moved by this that he called his wife to his bedside and he dictated to her this song. And the line is this from verse 26. In age and feebleness extreme, what shall a sinful worm redeem? Jesus, my only hope thou art, strength of my failing flesh and heart. Oh, could I catch a smile from thee and drop into eternity? It's the smile. It's the smile. I really pray this is how I go out. <laughs> right? Thinking about the amazingness of God. It's dear saints that go before us. So much we learn. So here's the thought then. God is the chief treasure from time and eternity. For time and eternity, verses 25 through 28. Many seek from God, right? And they seek God because of the blessings that they can receive. We do this. We delight in the forgiveness, right? And all of the things that we have, that we have received, but we do we just delight in Him. Because Asaph wants us to see that, that He is the treasure. It's not that we, we get all of these things and God. We get God. That's the treasure. All of these things are a means by which we enter into that relationship of having Him. Right? Those are a means to the end, not the end and of itself. But so often we're focused on the gift rather than the giver. This is why it's so hard for us sometimes when we receive things from God, we're always supposed to be like channels, channels only, right? We're a conduit. With everything flows out into the lives of other people. But the gift comes here and then we hang on to it. Instead of it cycling out from us and into the lives of others and then praise going back to God again. Also says, he's the treasure, right? He is the one who's sufficient for the thirsty soul. How many times we read through the Psalms, right? My soul, right? I thirst for you. I hunger for God. Do I desire God like that in my life? Yeah, you get when you're thirsty, right? Pasty, dry mouth. Gotta have water. Soda won't do. Juice won't do. It's just gotta be water, right? And then you take that drink and all of a sudden the quenching comes and you can feel it pass through your body. Is that how I feel about God? <laughs> if I did, I wouldn't have so much trouble getting up and spending time in His Word, would I? I wouldn't have trouble making the sacrifices he calls me to make. I would realize that it's all worth it. As Hebrews says, right, as they, they look back and they're, and they're going to suffer in prison like the others have suffered in prison, and they look back and as they're being taken to prison, they look back and see all of their positions being, positions being carried away from them, right, and everything being stripped away, and it says that they welcomed it with joy. If they came and took me away to jail for being a follower of Christ and a lover of God, and they seized my home and everything I had, would I receive it, welcome it with joy? Because in the end, I have a greater possession. Hebrews 10, go read it. Amazing. Psalms over and over call us, to just find our absolute delight in God, love God, stand in awe of God, exalt in God, delight in Him, rejoice in Him, be glad in Him, hope in Him, give thanks to Him because He's God. This is what a heart that is taken over by God, right? There is this total desire that is focused on God, verse 25. There is nothing, he says, there is nothing I desire beside you. Nothing. No relationship. Nothing. It doesn't matter what it is, who it is, whatever it is. I don't desire that any more than I desire. I desire you to the utmost. 
it's interesting in Hebrew, there's two negative particles, al and lo. Lo is a negative particle that says absolutely not, right? There is absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing I desire but you. Nothing. Because he alone is the one who satisfies my longing soul. Spurgeon, I, he just has a way of words, right? He turns away from the glitter which fascinated him to the true gold which was his real treasure. God is infinitely precious and satisfying. This is true intrinsically of God, whether anyone ever experiences this or not. That's an amazing truth. Whether we realize it or not, He is. <laughs> he just is. He doesn't exist because I believe He exists. He just is. God is the gracious, greatest treasure in the universe, exceedingly more valuable, exceedingly more beautiful than anyone or anything else. Asaph realized this. There's nothing to compete with God. Nothing. So then why is it that in my life there are things that I allow to compete with God? Verse 26, he talks about the fact that he is his portion forever. Experiencing God as our desired portion so intensely, so deeply, so thoroughly that all other goods of this world are as nothing. This is what glorifies God the utmost. When we find greatest delight in him. Because he's worthy. He's worthy. Verse 26, he reveals to us that total dependence is focused upon God. The strength of my heart, my portion forever. Total delight and confidence is found in God. In verse 28, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge. I will put all my faith and trust in him. All my confidence in him. He's where I go hide because <laughs> I can trust him with my life. Because even though I push him in the peripherals, he will always be there holding my right hand. <clears throat> he is the ultimate source of strength. And here's the last thought in verse 28 as he ends this psalm. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. If I treasure God, if I truly treasure him above all else, I will tell everyone else about his wonderful, Amen. wonderful works. Amen? Amen? It will make it known. Because God is amazing. <laughs> Dad, would you close in order of prayer, please?